and there is no threat to the public. This illness is not contagious. Yes, right now, we are at the exact location of today's deadly collision. 50,000 gallons are gone from three tankers. Those three tankers are in the James River. That grand jury, Chris, is still meeting at this time. If there are any new developments, we'll be sure to bring them to you. That's right, Chris. As we just heard, today's Malaysia Airlines crash may have been an act of terrorism. Jamie Lee Arthur was shot in the chest back in 2005. Those charitable organizations you just mentioned, well, they relied on the donations. Gene, the people I spoke with say that doesn't necessarily make them feel any better. Of course, the focus now turns to Governor-elect Harry McAuliffe. He'll be sworn in as governor this Saturday right here in Richmond. We came out here, my photographer and I, to check out those landslides and mudslides you just mentioned. Obviously, there's nothing more fun than hanging out at the Salem Fair on such a gorgeous evening. The medical examiner has yet to determine the exact cause of Julian Ginger Simpkins' death. It's hard to balance the county school nutrition budget. And tonight, Walnut Avenue is closed. Let me show you why. The word shock comes to mind. The people I spoke to that know Hunter say they can't believe what he's accused of. They're wonderful people, Jean, and it was a very tough conversation. You know, even in their darkest hour, they were poised, composed, and gracious. Everything Allison was, and right now, their highest priority is to honor her and carry on her legacy. You know, this was her home, and she loved you all so much. She was at the happiest point in her life that I've ever seen her. Andy and Barbara Parker told me that working at WDBJ7 was the highlight of Allison's life. We talked to her every day and, and after her, you know, ev after her hits in the morning, you know, I'd, I would always send her a text. And during one of those live reports, the Parkers came face to face with the darkest day of their life, the day their daughter Allison was gunned down in cold blood, along with her photographer, Adam Ward. It tears my heart out and, and just, you know, wrenches my soul to not know, to not see that text coming through and, and just say, what do you think, Dad? A fan of the arts and a driven journalist, Allison's parents remember her as the perfect daughter. So many teenagers go through angst with their parents and they, they have difficulties and they, they think their parents are stupid and they, and, and Allison was never that person. We had a unique relationship that she valued our opinion. The Parkers say they're proud of her drive and dedication and know that she would want everyone to be strong. The family is holding a celebration of Allison's life next week, but they're asking that their privacy be respected at this time. Nadia Singh, WDBJ7. Now, Rosanoff explained to me earlier today that Stefano's Italian Kitchen has its own entrance. You can see it right here. You have to walk around the building and around the corner to get to the front door of the club, which used to be known as 202. Tonight, the owner is telling his side of the story. There was no fight. The video showed that there was no fight. But that's not what Roanoke police say happened last Saturday morning. Investigators say Malik Roman drew a gun in a crowd and was shot at by an off-duty officer. Roman told police he got into a fight at the club and then got a gun from a nearby car. There is no fight within this crowd and that that police report is just for whatever reason is not accurate. Police also say there was at least 50 people crowded outside of the club, formerly known as 202, and in the same building at Stefano's Italian Kitchen. So we're looking at the club right here. We're looking at the club. We're okay. not looking at Stefano's. We're not looking at Stefano's in Italian Kitchen or Stefano's on the market. Rosanoff is adamant that the club and the restaurant are separate and don't even share the same hours. It's in the separate part of the building. He's also adamant that his business has gotten a bad rap over the years. This chart obtained by WDBJ7 shows there were 320 police incident reports associated with Rosanoff's businesses. The statistics uh, are old news. The current numbers I would anticipate would be far lower in all the downtown. Rosanoff says he's working with police and taking lots of safety measures. Is that uh, one of your bouncers? Yeah, actually, um, bouncer here, bouncer there. Well, wait, maybe that's not him. Well, yeah, this, that is him. Bouncer there. They stand right in the middle of the dance floor. Roman was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The officer involved is on administrative leave. Nadia Singh, WDBJ7.
That's the downtown Roanoke exit off of Interstate 581 South. Take a look behind me, Chris. This is Williamson Road. Looks like nothing happened except a couple of rain showers, but that wasn't the case just a couple of hours ago when emergency crews closed this area off and warned people to stay away. Some of those didn't heed those warnings. According to Mike Guzzo, the city of Roanoke's emergency management coordinator, the moving and standing water caused by flooding could be dangerous. It could contain sewage debris or other harmful materials. Guzzo adds that during situations like these, his team works overtime to keep the communities safe. With the threat of more drenching rain, emergency leaders are asking people to get to a safe place and stay there. Now, I was just told moments ago by officials on the scene that this off-ramp, the Exit 5 downtown Roanoke exit ramp, will reopen in just a few minutes. But just because roads and ramps are opening, folks, that doesn't mean that your morning commute will will be clean. It could be messy, so plan for that. And obviously, for the latest flood and weather information, you can head to our website, WDBJ7.com. Live in Roanoke, not a sink, WDBJ7. Gene, most of the city of Charlottesville, as you know, has been searched today. Crews hit Albemarle County again. Where they'll focus on next, though, depends on investigative tips from police. This is video shot earlier this afternoon on UVA's campus. You can see that search teams are using dogs and state-of-the-art technology. No massive searches with volunteers are planned this weekend, but trained search teams will be out. The search has not yet stretched to surrounding counties, and search and rescue team leaders say even the smallest shred of evidence could help in breaking this case. Footprints that you know are there um, that may or may not belong to you know, anybody related to the investigation. Um, we're looking for things that may have been dropped on the ground, and then of course, um, you know, we're always on the uh, being vigilant for anything that's out of place. As you just heard, investigators are asking the public to be extra vigilant this weekend and to report anything suspicious to police immediately. Live in Charlottesville, Nadia Singh, WDBJ7. WDBJ 7's Nadia Singh was the first reporter on the scene to bring you images of this wreck as it occurred. She spoke with numerous eyewitnesses who saw and heard what happened earlier today. Chris, right now we are at the exact location of today's deadly collision. State police say that the two people you just mentioned who died were the drivers of those tractor trailers you mentioned. You can see one of them right behind me completely destroyed and charred. Four other people were involved. Two of them are in the hospital tonight. The others were not injured. Eyewitnesses spoke exclusively to WDBJ7 just shortly after the deadly accident. Chris and Melissa, we know that 50,000 gallons are gone from three tankers. Those three tankers are in the James River. Crews will likely be here for the next several hours trying to figure out how this happened and, of course, start the cleanup process. But it's too soon to tell if there will be any negative environmental impacts from all of this. That's my river. That's the river I've been tasked to protect and to speak for. Pat Calvert works for the James River Association. Since it's so unclear how much damage might have been done to the river, he, like many others, is worried. What are we going to do about the potential risks? Here you can clearly see three crude oil tankers in the river after the derailment and what witnesses call scary. You could feel the heat, you could smell the fumes, and shortly after that we were all hauled off and evacuated. Lynchburg officials told WDBJ7 that one tanker is empty, one is full, and one is a third of the way full. 50,000 gallons of crude oil are missing. It's not clear if they burned off in the fire or have spilled into the water. Environmental experts say it's too early to determine any damage. As far as the specific impacts, that's to be seen. But the explosion and the fire that followed certainly impacted those who witnessed it firsthand. I was hiding behind a car. I wasn't 25 yards from the flames. And yeah, at that point, you're figuring that it, it could blow. This could be the last. I was very nervous for a few seconds there about, you know, because it started to travel down the river. I'm like, well, it's coming over here. For now, crews are working and environmental experts are urging the public to be vigilant and cautious. To take photographs of anything unusual, any adverse effects that they might witness, and then um, if they see any fish kills, for example, take a photograph. Don't wander into the river. 
CSX representatives, local officials, and of course the National Transportation Safety Board are all here trying to clear that wreckage. City of Lynchburg officials tell me, Chris and Melissa, that CSX expects to have all of this cleared up and cleared out by the end of the day tomorrow. So we'll see what happens there. In the meantime, we're live in Amherst County, Naughty Singh, WDBJ7. Governor Bob McDonald took center stage on the House floor for the last time Wednesday as he gave his final State of the Commonwealth address. His remarks were met favorably. He set the right tone, a tone of uh, conciliation and a compromise. The fact that we got things done when we did get things done because of compromise and reaching across party lines. Legislators said the governor seamlessly recounted the triumphs of his administration while remembering those who spearheaded many of his initiatives. It was a very moving and gracious speech. He reached out and complimented people from the General Assembly. The history will remember Governor McDonald very kindly uh, for all that he's done for the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. We're bringing jobs and opportunities back to Virginia during very tough economic times for reforming our public education system, so many other things that he's done. They were also moved by what seemed to be genuine remorse from the governor after this year's ethics investigation into his gift-giving scandal. You know, I think part of what has happened to him over the last year had a, a real impact on him. But that aspect of his time in office seemed to be on the back burner Wednesday night. The tone among the state's lawmakers was positive as McDonald wraps up his tenure and a new leader is poised to take charge. The House is controlled by um, Republicans. Uh, the Senate's a toss-up. And, uh, you know, with Democrats in the governor's mansion, it's going to be important for all of us to work together. Of course, the focus now turns to Governor-elect Harry McAuliffe. He'll be sworn in as governor this Saturday right here in Richmond, and he'll be giving his own State of the Commonwealth address on Monday. Live in Richmond at the State Capitol, Nadia Singh, WDBJ7. Jamie Lee Arthur was shot in the chest back in 2005. She says it's something she'll never forget, and that's why she knew how to help the victim. I heard two gunshots, and... Everybody was like, what, what was that? And um, a bunch of people were saying it was backfire. I said it wasn't backfire, that was gunshot. And Jamie Lee Arthur knows all too well what it's like to experience gunfire up close and personal. I knew it was gunshots. I, I want to hear loud things. I can. I can tell, I, and I don't know if it's because I've been shot. Arthur didn't waste a minute. I immediately jumped into my car, and I ran over the curb and um, come into here. And as I did, I heard, um, I heard two shots, and I asked um, someone to hand me a shirt so I could put pressure to his chest. Arthur tried her best to keep the victim calm and talking. As I was applying pressure, I was asking him questions. Um, what did the, what does the guy look like? As she waited for help to arrive, her own dark memories brought her to tears. I always said that if I've ever seen anybody go through what I went through that day, that I would never just walk away and just let it happen. I'm standing in the Shules Furniture Store parking lot where this all happened just around 10 o'clock today. The victim you just heard about suffered serious injuries but is stable right now. Tonight, police are looking for the shooter. Live in Ron Ignati saying WDBJ7. I'm at the intersection of Walnut Avenue and Laurel Street. That's very close to Mill Mountain. And tonight, Walnut Avenue is closed. Let me show you why. See this huge tree or part of a tree fell down in the middle of the road. You can see pieces of it everywhere. It even took one of the power lines here in the neighborhood down with it. And this wasn't an unfamiliar scene all around Roanoke today. Some people, luckily, were only picking up a branch or two. Others were dealing with a mess like this. But some people were worried about the future of their homes.